The Quiet Village Girl written by Cyprian Jossen Audiobook Chapter 1, Our Land I lived in a calm village in the heart of the forest. At dawn, I had the habit of waking up at the sound of the rooster's crow, the only clock of the land. In Iliagba, people lived in harmony with nature, and the village was a mix of people, domestic and wild animals. The women toiled from morning until dusk to provide food for their husbands and children. Early in the mornings, accompanied by my grandmother, I used to go to the stream to fetch water. At the same time, my grandfather would be sound asleep, snoring like a fat pig on his wooden handmade bed. My village was famous for its fertile land and its inhabitants worshipped various deities. They would pray to the gods of the land to bless their farms and provide them with bountiful harvests. However, my grandmother, Nielma, always relied on her rosary and prayed to the Christian god. Despite this, her harvest was just as plentiful as those who worshipped Amadioha, the god of lightning and thunder. Many in the village wondered how this could be possible, as she did not offer any offerings or sacrifices to the powerful deity. But she knew the truth, her success was not because of a god, but because of her hard work. My grandma was kind to everyone. One day, I accompanied her to a farm located at a considerable distance from home, in a place called Umu, to plant cassava and okra. The village of Iliagba practiced land shifting, which allowed the land to rest and rejuvenate every two years. As we trekked to the farm, walking barefoot, my grandmother told me that the soil in Umu was particularly rich and fertile, which was why the community would never consider selling the land to outsiders. Our land is our soul, she told me. After working all day on the farm, I was exhausted. I sat down under a large tree and leaned against the trunk and napped away. The cassava stems that I had harvested were lying nearby. I used some cassava stems as my pillow. Suddenly, I slept off on the green grass. It was a deep and sweet sleep, the type that restores your spirit and breaks your day into two, making you agree with the mysteries of nature. I heard a voice. Amaka, Amaka, Nielma called me. It was like a distant voice. I felt a hand on my shoulder. It's not good for a young girl to snore like the engine of a train, she said. I am sorry ma, I answered her. The scorching sun burned my dark skin and I was darker than the workers coming out from a coal mine. Follow me, my grandmother ordered me. She took me to a shelter, under the Udara tree. The red fruits were ready for plucking and on the ground, nobody who came across it picked one. Do not touch any of these fruits, Grandma yelled at me. I like you Dara, Grandma, I pleaded. The fruits you see here belong to the spirits, she warned me. Which spirits are you talking about, I asked. Drink water and stop asking stupid questions. She brought out the small udu filled with water from her basket. If you break the udu, the soil will drink the water. Really? I've never heard of such a thing, I said. We must always treat the earth with kindness and respect, she replied. I took the pot gently from her, and after drinking, she took it back from me. Now her turn, she gobbled the fresh water down her throat, cherishing it like she was eating delicious food. N.W.A. Omo, your chi is bright. Let your chi always be awake, she blessed me as she put back the water pot in her basket. The birds were chirping and pegging the Udara fruits. They are eating the fruits of the gods, and nothing will happen to them. In my next world, I will reincarnate as a bird, I whispered. But Nioma heard me. She sighed loudly. It's only our chi who knows how and when we can come back to this world. Stop dreaming my child, she said. She left me and continued her work on the farm. As soon as Grandma had moved to a far distance, the noise of a rattlesnake crawling on the dry grass surprised me. It was a cobra. Its head was already stretching up when I tried to escape. But the big snake dived toward my right leg and bit me. I'm lucky to be here today to tell you my story. Grandma, a snake has bitten me on my right leg. I cried. Dot my grandmother quickly rushed to kill the snake with her hoe, but the beast moved back to the bush, near the farm. Brave Grandma took a risk. Then she used her scarf to tie above the place, the snake has bitten me. Nielma looked up at the sky and prayed, nothing will happen to you. I am here she said. 
Let me tie it so that the snake's venom will not get to your heart, she said. She quickly packed her hose, cutlass, and her wooden basket. We left the farm in a hurry in fear that the cobra might come back for revenge. I was feeling dizzy on the way, and my grandma helped me on the long journey as I limped back home. Passersby who saw us greeted Ndunwam, Ogir, sorry my child, nothing will happen to you. Grandma and I moved slowly until we finally got home to tell our story. But some cynical villagers did not believe us. Amaka is suffering from hallucination, they laughed at Grandma. Iliagba village was a quiet place. The people lived on their farm harvests, fishing, hunting, and selling their products to the neighboring villages. The men in the village do wake up early in the morning to catch fish in their fee with buckets. It was the morning duty to check their fish traps up here in their family streams. Every family had their own miri, quiet water, or stream for fishing. So the streams in Iliagba provided everyday baskets of fresh fish for the women to carry to the market. It was also a land of many traditions and customs. The people of Iliagba lived a communal life and were very peaceful. They occupied a landmass of not less than 2,000 square meters. Iliagba had a level land topography. There are no hills and valleys found therein. Rivers and vegetation were gifts given to the people by their chi. Men and women, boys and girls went to the main river, called Onukwa River, to fetch water for domestic use. Apart from the river, they also have enough farmland which they shared equally with every member of the family. Women were not included in the sharing of farmlands because it was assumed that they were under the control of their husbands and the girls would be married off to strong men who are rich in another village where they would be provided for by future husbands. Iliagba men were superior to the women whose role was to cook for their husbands and take care of the children. The woman is the property of the man because he paid her dowry. I was disgusted with this ancient culture. It's barbaric, I told my grandmother, who disagreed. You are going to get married one day. A woman's place is in the kitchen, she told me. I disagree, Grandma, I replied. Will you shut up, you bad girl, she shouted. I'm sorry Grandma, I will not say that again, I said. However, Iliagba people were guided by certain laws, I will Allah. Whenever any of the villagers flouts the I will Allah, it must be investigated. The accused person must be judged at the village square and if found guilty, undergoes punishment. The case was presided over by the village chief judge, called Nei or Izianyai. I hated this old man. In this patriarchal society young girls were accused of a crime they didn't commit. It was an abomination for any girl to get pregnant before marriage. Worst still, she has no right to abort the pregnancy should it happen. But it happened that a village girl by the name of Maria Ndinta got impregnated and aborted the three months pregnancy. Some vigilant boys in the village knew and reported Maria Ndinta. She was judged and found guilty. The chief judge fined her one white cock, a basket of cola nuts, two unisex baby clothes, and two runs of baby milk. The youths went to her father's compound to pour all kinds of tree branches and trash. She was ostracized from the youth meetings until after a year when some rituals were done on her behalf to ward off the anger of the trickster, a Lucy, that caused her misfortune. On that day, she was stripped naked in public. There was also a case of a very young man called Afani who impregnated an OSU girl. The young man was from the Diala, a pure-blood family. When he introduced the young girl to his parents for marriage, his father, a chief in the land, blamed him. It is against our tradition to allow an OSU girl into the family. Their ancestors offered themselves to evil spirits in exchange for money. This girl will drag us down, he rebuked his son. She is pregnant for me papa. Tradition or no tradition, I will marry her. Ngozi is the woman of my life, he told his father. Akemba, the boy's father thought twice and set up a committee of elders to confirm the OSU origin of Ngosi, beautiful, tall with fair skin like Oyanbo Europeans. In their investigation, the elders discovered that the girl came from Nwi, another village far from Iliagba, a true untouchable, an OSU blood. Akemba's wife accepted the girl, but the man ostracized his own son to a faraway village out of fear of what his peers would tell him. Aru-im, abomination, he shouted Afani, 
His son went to live with his mother-in-law and the pregnant girl in their hometown until she gave birth to a bouncing baby girl named Uzoma. The OSU, the Untouchables, and the Diala, pure blood of the land, customs have been there from ancient days until now. The OSU people were not born to marry the Dialas. If any side mistakenly disobeys the rule, the couple must be banished. It is an abomination in the land. My grandparents were from the upper caste, the pure blood. They showered me with so much love and care. The hut where we were living served as a living room, bedroom, and kitchen at the same time. Life was not easy for Pa Ikna and Neoma. At my tender age, I was a very beautiful girl, and my pointing fat breast drove both young and old boys crazy. I had a bony complexion, plump and lively even at the age of twelve, I looked sixteen. I had already started helping my parents with house chores. I swept my grandparents' rooms and the large compound and joined older girls to fetch water at the village stream. Sometimes, my grandmother would tell me not to engage myself in running too many errands, but I wouldn't listen to her. I was delighted to help her. I started school at the age of six, but I looked older than my age. I was enrolled in a school called Aquosa because, at that time, children who were seven could be admitted into primary one in the village. In this school, I was one of the best pupils, always in the first position, with a reasonable gap, scoring higher in all subjects. The owner of Aquosa Primary School became so interested in me, especially for my outstanding performance at the end of the term. Everybody called me Electric Brain because I was quick to unravel any puzzle. Mr. Moses was the owner of my school. He was a short, fair-complexioned old man. He was very strict and disciplined. Moses wanted his pupils to be distinct from other children in that village. He spoke English very intelligibly and was proud of his cursive handwriting, which he taught his pupils. This he did deliberately to adequately prepare them for admission into his secondary schools, where they can continue in his institutions. Despite his age, Mr. Moses, the headmaster, and owner of Aquosa used to ride a white bicycle which earned him prestige and respect because he was among the few that rode bicycles in the 60s. The villagers called him Motsi Moses, which means Mr. Moses, in the Igbo language. He spoke Igbo and English perfectly well with style using idioms and proverbs to impress his listeners. People called him Dictionary and admirers called him Mr. Queen's English. I'm a grammarian, he boasted. His pupils loved and feared him so much that they dare not come to school late because he could flog them until tears rolled out of their eyes. Even some parents would report their children to Mr. Moses whenever they misbehave at home, and he would take time to correct the child by giving due punishment such as sweeping the classrooms and cleaning the chalkboard. His pupils nicknamed him Ogbo, meaning the killer. But on the contrary, the pupils learned discipline to the extent that every parent in Iliagba made sure that his child attended Aquosa Primary School before being admitted into a secondary school. All the subjects and topics taught in the school were aimed at giving the pupils the keys to success. It was not a big surprise that all of Mr. Moses' pupils were leading the other children in the school. But I was the best in the class. To my surprise, Mr. Moses allowed me to teach arithmetic to my classmates the day I got all the answers. Amaka my arithmetic guru, come and teach them how you got the correct answers. I moved to the blackboard to add, minus, or multiply figures as the pupils pay attention. And Mr. Moses was there marking the papers. I will teach you the tips for the two times table, I told them. Mary come to the board and solve this problem. I said. Mary dragged her legs, because she was one of the dummies in the classroom. She hesitated, robbed her red eyes. She knew that Mr. Moses would flog her if ever she did not get the right answer. She took the chalk from me and scribbled something strange on the board. She was drawing sticks in rows until she got to the answer. The smile on her face was like moonlight. Clap for her, I asked the class. Mr. Moses told them to copy my examples from the board. There was a boy, Innocent was his name. He used to take the second position in class after I had come first with a score margin. One morning, he walked up to me glaring at me with a disgusting look of disdain. Amaka, beware, next term, the first position will be mine, Innocent told me. I laughed and told him that it wouldn't happen. 
Let's bet innocent, I will beat you again, I told him. Innocent studied very hard that term. I was not perturbed or distracted by him. In the end, I emerged first. From that day onward, Innocent never competed with me until we left Aquosa Primary School.